the proverbial pebble dropped in a pond, some surfers have an influence so profound it ripples across oceans and through time to shape surfing for decades to come. This is the ripple effect. It's the early 80s in Surf City, Huntington Beach, and the local surfboard industry is booming. Colors are loud and fluoro, hair is spiky and gelled, and lady swimwear sits outrageously high above the hip. And in a dusty shaping bay in Costa Mesa, local shaper Bob Hurley is about to make a fateful, spur-of-the-moment business deal that will echo through the surf industry for decades to come. The town was filled with celebrity shapers. I was not one of them. I was in the back doing hard work, getting a nice paycheck. Six days a week, all day, every day, and on the seventh day, I rested. Not only did I rest, I was in a coma, I slept. My wife couldn't wake me up. This is Bob today, still in the shaping bay mowing foam. This is the first planner Bob ever owned, with which he shaped an estimated shitload of boards. This is Bob's shaping bay. Standard issue, blue walls, fluoro lighting, dust on the floor. How long have you been shaping, Bob? I started shaping at 18. 24, I had my own surfboard company. But Bob Hurley would soon have bigger things on his mind than filling custom orders. This is the Hurley design room. This is the Hurley print room, where they still do custom tees and prints the old-fashioned way. Look at these colors. My God. This is the Hurley skate ramp, where on any given day you might find Bob Bernquist or Kern Capels grinding the coping. This is not that day. And this is the Hurley music studio, where the likes of The Green, Stick Up Kid, and Blonde Fire have laid down tracks. Today we have Pat on a ukulele. Bob Hurley's story neatly intertwines the hard grind of surfboard shaping, the meteoric rise of a homegrown surf brand, and perhaps the boldest move in surf industry history. Bob Hurley. I never, I never, I never actually, I, was, I don't know that I've ever been formally introduced to him. Um, when did I hear first about Bob Hurley? The first time I met Bob, he was uh, skateboarding through the art department. Oh, wait, yeah, it's coming back. Yeah, Bob's a great neighbor. <laughs> he comes and he leeches food off me all the time. Yeah. It's Bob was one of the first people to sponsor Taylor's movies. I did a photo session once uh, of he and some other young lions of the surfboard industry. His wife and him were cleaning toilets back then. Who goes, I don't know why I'm here. I can't understand what, I know why these guys are in the picture. Can I just stand with you while you shoot their picture? Yeah. It's a very interesting approach to doing it. He's like, hey, the waves are good in front of my house. You guys should go check it out right now. And I was like, oh, wow, I guess I am in the right place. And Bob was by far the most uh, intriguing and beguiling of all of them because he, he just came up and asked me questions the whole time. So, I mean, do you do this all the time? Do you shoot a lot of pictures, Craig? I know you do a lot of things, but do you shoot a lot of pictures? And I go, well, am I shooting a lot of them now, Bob? Bob's father was in the military and the family moved constantly. Had to meet new friends, learn a new language. My dad passed away in Japan, went back to Rhode Island, and my wonderful mom at 27 with three little kids said, all right, boys, we're going to the West Coast. And I said, Mom, who, who are we going to see? She goes, I don't know anyone there. We're just, we're going for it. Route 66, let's do this. Bob played high school football, and when two of his teammates turned up with long, sun-bleached locks, the coach told them they looked like girls and to get it cut. But Bob was intrigued. What's up with the hair? Are your parents in the styling business, or what's going on? like, no, 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 we surf. It bleaches out. And I go, you didn't dye your hair. And they're like, no, we didn't dye it. It bleaches out. And I go, wow, is there any way I can go surfing with you sometime? I always invited myself everywhere. Kind of a bad etiquette thing, but I did. And that's how I discovered surfing. They took me. Bob surfed the south side of Huntington Pier with a tight pack of locals and got a job at Wind and Sea Surf Shop. Wind and Sea, I thought I was like the hot kid at the shop. I was a team writer. Like, he put me in ads and stuff like that. And I thought, this is insane. I'm sponsored by a cool shop. I'm going to surf in contest. And Guy paid for a couple of entries for me. And then I lost right away. And I, I'm like, well, okay, fair enough. I didn't earn him his money, so I'll pay for my own. And I kept losing right away. So I realized I'm a really bad professional surfer. And by the way, really when I look back, I wasn't a very good surfer, but I thought I was. You know, the head was huge and the wetsuit neck was small, but Bob's in denial that he's a good surfer. Yeah, so I, I learned how to make surfboards and he helped me. Most of the best shapers are shaper surfers and, and he's definitely one of those. <laughs> Al Merrick, I think it even still says Bob's one of the greatest craftsmen of a surfboard. They're amazing. I love them. I love riding them. And it's, uh, he's definitely a craftsman when it comes down to it. 
Pretty soon, the best surfers in town were riding Hurley's boards and visiting pros came knocking. PT just walks in my shaping room one day and said, Hurls! PT, mate. And I said, yeah, I know, I know who you are. He's like, I need some boards. You're making me some surfboards. And I'm like, really? Awesome. I rode that seven quarter, the last man-on-man -man final of the decade against MR. And Rabbit wanted to get on to 20s. He made me this fantastic twin fin and I won a few CT events on it. I won three CT events on it. So that really gave me a lot of credibility, having Rabbit, you know, a, a world champ, and PT a world champ, just saying, no, nope, this guy from Huntington, his boards are as good as anyone else's, which probably wasn't true, but their coaching was good. Others had noticed Hurley's shaping talent and the popularity of his boards. Aaron Pye at Huntington Surf and Sport asked to buy some boards from him, but Bob didn't have his own logo or enough money to buy raw materials. Why don't you make a label and, uh, and we'll pay you like $300 a board. And he wrote me a check right then and there for $2,400. Blew my mind. Said, make whatever you want. Make whatever sells. You know what's going on, I don't. But just bring him down to the store when he's done. And uh, he did, and that was the start of Hurley Surfboards. Hurley Surfboards was born, but Bob's keen eye was soon caught by a colorful new surfwear brand. Uh, I'm back. Oh, it's good to be back. Billabong. First heard about Billabong through Chip Rowland and Daryl Dugas, and uh, they just had a couple shorts, and the shorts were sick, man. They were punk rock, they were long. I wanted a piece of that. Bob started writing to Billabong founder Gordon Merchant in Burley Heads, Australia, keen to formalize an agreement to sell his gear in the U.S., but heard nothing back. So one day in Costa Mesa, Gordon Merchant just turns up out of nowhere. I'm full of foam dust, completely annoyed, semi-hungry, a little behind in my work. He's got three kids on his way to Disneyland. And I'm like, dude, where have you been? And then all of a sudden he says, okay, 3,000 pairs of shorts, $9 each, 27,000. Are you in? And immediately I said, of course. Why wouldn't I be? <laughs> Despite his shaky finances, Bob's timing could not have been better. Early days of Billabong USA were incredibly exciting. It was a 24-hour day filled with nothing but excitement and opportunity and killer decisions to be made. Should we sponsor the Billabong Pro? Should we, should we do a new film with Aki? Should we, should we make these crazy kind of shorts and we don't care what people think? I mean, we could do all this stuff. You had like a magic wand and it was so fun. In 1999, with Billabong US doing $100 million annually and it's Australia, Australian parent company preparing to float on the stock exchange, Bob did the unthinkable. This, this is the when Bob walks away from the $100 million on the table question. He handed back the U.S. license for Billabong to start his own label. It's only $100 million. How could you, you know, would you stay there for the little money or would you go off and risk everything on an unknown venture? He wants to walk, taking the fishbowl. Of course you would risk it on the unknown venture because 100 million is not enough to even blink at. We wanted to include people. We're very comfortable that we serve, I shape boards, got it, killer. That does not make me cool, you know? And uh, we like the idea of positivity and making something out of yourself and so we wanted a different kind of company. There were other intensely personal reasons for Bob's new path. So in 97, I got cancer and uh, I, it caused me to evaluate like, you know, the voices inside of me and, and uh, it wasn't about analysis anymore. It was real life and like, where do you wanna go and what you wanna do? And it kind of framed up our thinking for the future. It was one thing for Bob to listen to that little voice inside, but it was quite another to break the news to 150 employees. It was like, dude, you just cost me my job. You know, that was pretty much the response. Well, it was a little scary at first, you're on a winning horse, like you're riding off into the sunset and you decide that that's not the horse you want to ride. It's pretty wild. Bob, Bob knows what he's doing um, and it's gonna turn out great. Not only did he believe in himself, but he had a lot of people believing in him too. I had a lot of faith in Bob of what he was doing and where we were gonna go. So, you know, it was a little bit of a challenge, but at the same time, I mean, it was exciting. He's fascinating, with, you know, to watch in the sense that he just changes stuff up all the time arguably fearless and he plays with his own money and he's all in all the time i go whoa that's a big that is a big uh that is a big change but if anybody can pull it off it's it's bob but having taken that fateful leap, the next most vexing question was the name of this ambitious new brand. They're like, you gotta be kidding me. Early, stupidest name ever. Just a complete arrogant asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the exact same logos, 
as like the Hilton. Couldn't think of anything else? It's all about me. Hi, my name's Bob. Look at my name on the shorts. Yeah, put your last name on something, yeah. on your shirt. Naming a company is probably the hardest thing you can do. It's got to be so tough. It's what his boards had always been Hurley boards, and I mean, why wouldn't, what's the difference? You know, I mean, he wasn't confused. Hurry. <laughs> it's a brand about moving fast. Hurry. <laughs> Can't find anybody to say anything bad about the guy. Why not put a good name out there? Why not put a name that everybody in the industry knows and is stoked about? What came with it is his reputation. And that alone just opened so many doors. What does it all mean, man? It all sounds funny in the beginning. Until you put a logo and some people behind it, it's just like, dude, what? The new brand immediately struck a chord. Its slogan, Microphone for Youth, capturing the zeitgeist and reflecting a new, broader surf culture with close ties to skate, fashion, music, and art. A conversation Bob had with world champion Rabbit Bartholomew 20 years earlier provided the defining ethos of the new brand. I said, Rabbit, dude, you're Rabbit Bartholomew. He's like, I know. And I said, oh, I'm Bob Hurley, but you don't know me, but um, it's cool if you come. We, we already saw you as we talked about it. You can come surf out there with us. And he's like, oh, mate, that is so gracious of you. You, but I, I just want to let you know, I'm going to stay in here with the kids. That's where I get my inspiration and my energy. And I was just floored at his, A, his graciousness, but uh, B, his vision and, and like where the energy and where the future comes from. Because we were about protecting our hierarchy, you know, and uh, huge life lesson for me. And it really, it really framed up my thinking for my life and business. There was no real plan, but when Hurley soared to nearly $80 million in sales in its third year, Bob soon had to make one. He held a meeting and announced his plan to grow Hurley to a billion dollar business in 10 years. Bob soon realized he'd need a cashed up new partner to fulfill his latest bold dream. He persuaded Nike director Tom Clark to set up a meeting with Nike founder Phil Knight. I, he goes, you seem really nervous. He actually put his hand on my shoulder. He was so nice. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Phil. Um, I thought, Tom, I thought you were going to do the meeting. Thanks for the heads up. And then he said, oh, Phil said, uh, do you got a PowerPoint we can go through? And I said, I, no, I don't even know what that is. What is it? And he started laughing and he goes, oh, this is going to be the best meeting of my day. Can we just have a conversation? The former surfboard shaper and the self-made sportswear mogul found some unlikely common ground. The driving force was the boards we made for Rabbit. It was to be lighter, faster, more flexible, which knowing what I know now, that's why Nike made shoes. So that kind of intrigue, Phil. The young upstart of the surf industry now had to adjust to life as part of a large public company. So how does Bob spend his days? Text me and Bill, hey, we're surfing at 845. It's surfers, it's what we do. And, um, I'm gonna go back home now. <laughs> and then he puts the blinds down and he sits on his couch and he watches Rachel Ray make a 10 minute meal of lasagna with turkey beef in it. Like who so, watches that? Then about three o'clock he goes, hey, it's kind of windy, but you know, at surfers, that's what you want to do. You want to surf? He goes, hey, it's about 8.30, grandpa's gotta go. And then that's it. Falls asleep on the couch Falls asleep on the couch. Watching the Food Network. Watching the Food Network. Never cooking a meal in his whole no, entire life. No, he's a life. professional eater, but not a professional cooker. Hurley embraced Nike's taste for innovation, its phantom board shorts taking out the SEMA award as board short of the year for five years straight. In 2012, Nike shut down its surf brand Nike 6.0 and rolled its sponsored riders into the Hurley team, making it one of the most stacked surf teams in history. Despite the wild ride, Bob insists he has never strayed far from his roots as a surfer, shaper, and occasional toilet cleaner. We try to get through this business world and, uh, and this profession by um, using the golden rule, which is treating others how you'd like to be treated. And it, it kind of, uh, it can be complicated at times, but it actually feels that simple to treat others well. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I got here. I just, you know, I just did a couple things. It's everybody else. It's not me. That's Bob in a nutshell.